Us out right here. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. We need this, bro. Give me the truth. Come on, bro. Austin, you better preach, bro. Come on, Brandon. Uh, help you us out, preach, bro. Come on, bro. First Corinthians 15 in verse 9. Tell how it is, bro. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. I'm dumping it. For I am the least of the apostles. Come on, Pat. And did not even deserve to be called an apostle. Mm. You know, when you feel entitled, you know that you're like on a road to destruction. Oh, yeah. Oh. Paul said, I, I don't even deserve uh -oh. to be called an apostle wow. because I persecuted the church of oh. God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Yeah. And his grace to me was not without effect. Oh. No. I worked harder than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Amen. Yeah. You know, it's incredible because Paul... This is a man who understood how undeserving yeah. of the grace of God he was. Yeah, so true. He said, yeah. you know what? I persecuted the church oh. of God. Oh. Oh, I don't even deserve no. to be called an apostle. Wow. Wow. And he said it was the grace of God Whoa. that was working within him. Okay. Nice. Today we're going to study out grace. Amen. Grace. Come on, bro. You know, it's interesting because I've, I've often asked people, uh-oh. What do they think grace is? Because mm. most people will say, you know what? All I need is grace to be saved. All I need is grace to be saved. For surely you can explain the very thing that has given you salvation. Come on, bro. And come most on. people can't. Yeah, come on. Most people confuse grace and mercy. Oh. Yeah. Now, what's the difference? Mercy is not being given something that you do deserve. Right? right? So let's say you hold up a 7-Eleven. Uh-oh. Okay. And you, the police arrest you. But they're like, you know what? We're going to let you go this time. Nice. So they're not giving you what you deserve. That's called mercy. Oh, thank you. Grace is actually the opposite. Ooh, thank you for the finding. Grace is being given something that you don't deserve. Wow. Yeah. So grace would be you hold up the 7-Eleven, and not only do they let you go, but they give you a million dollars and say, go and be on the hey. road. That's grace. Of that. And you got to understand that that's what Paul is talking about. He's like, I don't deserve what I have been given. Yeah. Yeah. Grace is unmerited favor. Mm. It's unmerited favor. Yeah. What is the grace of God? How is it displayed in our life? The grace of God is Jesus Christ, perfect, wow. dying on a cross, wow. sinless, wow. for you and I sin. Yes. And there's a difference Free between grace and mercy. Yeah. It's all right here. And it's incredible because what I found is very similar to Paul. Uh, we have to understand that grace really is like fuel in our engine. Ooh, yeah. Nice. Yeah. Imagine trying to put water oh. in your car instead of gas. Oh. Oh. How far would it get? Uh oh. You're not gonna get very far. Oh. That's like trying to do things just simply out of selfish ambition. Oh. You're not gonna get very far. Oh, imagine, right. imagine trying to put V8 splash in your car. Oh. <laughs> it tastes good inside of, inside of our body, Tasty. but it's not going to get you very far. Oh. That's like being fueled by pride. Oh. 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 He said, what was his fuel? The grace of God. Wow. Like the title of our message is By the Grace of God. Wow. wow. Come on, bro. You know, years ago when I was in Hawaii, uh, and we were tagging. For those who don't know, tagging is uh, fundraising that we do. And what it essentially is, is, is we ride on a bunch of signs, and we go on a busy street corner, and we have buckets and a speaker, and we just ask people to donate to help evangelize the world. It's actually a very profitable way to raise money. Amen? But you know, on my way to this tagging event in Hawaii, I quickly realized, oh snap, Uh oh, my car does not have much gas left. Uh, but I ignored all of the warning signs. Uh, so I'm like, you know what? We walk by faith, not by sight. You yeah. ever heard of drive by faith, not by sight? That's right. I'm, like, I'm driving by faith, baby, and I'm going to make it to my destination. Yeah. And so as I'm driving, the car starts slowing down. Uh-oh. I was like, for 
for sure we, I'm not hitting the pedal hard. Oh. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, so, let me, let me floor it. Come on. Wait, the car <laughs> slowing down even more. <laughs> this is problematic. Uh -oh. And what I eventually realized is I ran out of gas. Wow. Why? Because I ignored the warning signs. Wow. What you gotta understand is for every single one of us, grace is the gas in our tank that gets mm. us going wow. yeah. wow. And what we're gonna look at are the three indicators mm. if the grace of God is truly present Ooh. in our lives. Oh, and yeah, if it's not, uh -oh. don't ignore the warning signs. <gasps> But get in touch with the grace of God. Come on, bro. Go over to Titus chapter 2. Yeah. I'm with you, bro. Help us out right here. We have three points tonight. In Titus chapter 2 in verse 11. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. We'll find our first. Come on, bro. Go out soon. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness nice. and worldly passions <laughs> and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives uh -oh. in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, nice. who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own eager to do what is good. <laughs> Not incredible because the passage, it says that ultimately grace, it teaches us something. Oh, yeah. It says that grace teaches us Preach, bro. to say no wow. yes. to ungodliness. Wow. To say no to worldly passions. Wow. Point number one, grace teaches us to say no. Wow. But the reality is you gotta ask yourself, whoa, if I'm consistently saying yes to a godliness, uh -oh. if I'm consistently saying yes to worldly passions, uh -oh. is the grace of God truly present in our life? Oh. Oh. You know, for many people in the religious world that we live in today, grace has become their license yeah. to sin. Yeah, so oh. Grace has become the excuse oh. where the scriptures say that grace is not the excuse of our sin. Grace is the very reason that we don't yeah. sin. Yes, sir. Come on, bro. To a godliness. Nice. You know, it's interesting because what you find is history doesn't actually change. It just repeats itself. Oh. Yeah. So many of the things that you find are prevalent today were very prevalent during the time of the Bible. Whoa. If you look in Jude chapter 1 and verse 4, it talks about a time, and I'll just read the scripture. It says, for certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are ungodly people. Who pervert the grace of our God oh, wow. into a license for immorality oh, no. and deny Jesus our only sovereign and Lord. Oh no. You know, this thinking was prevalent during the first century. Yeah, right. so true. Where people were talking about, hey, God's grace, it's okay, live how you want to. Oh, no. And people have twisted and perverted the grace of God Whoa. to be a license to live however we deem. Whoa. Right. Wow. But the scriptures say no For the person who has been taught by the grace of God right. It's the very reason That we live a life in righteousness wow. Wow. Right. Wow. Right. Come on, bro. Talk about that. What you got to ask yourself Is have you been taught by the grace of God Wow Dang. You know Go over to Galatians chapter 5 oh, Come on bro Check his there, bro Galatians bro Go, bro. Come on, Austin. And it's funny because most people automatically, when they think of grace, they think of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. Yeah. Right. But if you actually do a topical study on grace in the Bible, uh -oh. they're all the most intense passages in the Bible. Yeah. Yeah. Like, they're all really, really hardcore. Yeah. Galatians chapter 5, in verse 16. Let's go, bro. I think it's there, bro. So I say, walk by the Spirit. And you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Nice. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit. Amen, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. Mm -hmm. They're in conflict with each other. So that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the spirit, mm -hmm. you are not under the law. Wow. Yeah. You know, Paul, he writes through the Holy Spirit 
that in every single person, there's two desires. Mm. Right. That we have the desires of the flesh, yep. and we have the desires the of the spirit. Yeah. That's right. And he says that these two desires are constantly at war with each other. Yep. Constantly in friction. Yeah. You ever been in a situation where you're like, man, yeah. I should not do that. Yeah. 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 But then everything inside of you is telling you, no, no, no. Do oh, yeah. snap. That's what he's saying. Wow. Yeah. It's constant friction. Yeah. Mm. You know, there was once a, a guy that I met in the gym. Uh oh. This is a couple years back. Uh -oh. And I was sharing my faith, and, and he just got very open with me about what he was going through in life. And he was saying, man, I'm struggling with this and this. And how do I overcome these things? And I said, it's, it's actually fairly simple. No. What do you need to do? Wake up early. Ooh. Spend time with God. Yeah. Get in your Bible. Yeah. Spend more time in the Word than you do in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Walk by the Spirit. Wow, wow, wow. Walk by God's Word. Yeah. And you'll find yourself overcoming yeah. the desires of the flesh. Yeah. Yeah. You know, this is also described by an old uh, sage who actually had one of his acolytes or his students ask him, man, how is it possible that there is so much evil as well as so much good in the world. Yeah. Right. Wow. And you see this all the time, right? You, you see so much beauty yeah. as well as so much destruction. Yeah. Right. Wow. And then he distilled this down to people on an individual, on an individual basis. He said, how is it possible yeah. that the same person who's so capable of love, Whoa. who's so capable of purity, yeah. who's so capable of righteous acts, is also capable of such atrocities. Wow. Yeah. Is also capable of such evil. Wow. Is so capable of, of things that we dare not even speak of. Whoa. And the sage told him, ultimately inside of every single person, there's a war that's going on. Yeah. And there's two dogs. There's a dog that desires life. There's a dog that desires love. There's a dog that desires peace. But there's also a dog that desires destruction. <laughs> There's a dog that desires oh, evil. On, yeah. There's a dog that desires wickedness. Yeah, talk about that. And they're in constant war with each other. Wow. And ultimately, one of them is going to win. Wow. So the young man asked him, which one is the one that is going to prevail? This is fire, bro. And he says, the one that you feed. Whoa. Come on, bro. If you feed the flesh, oh, best believe you will reap what you sow. But if you feed the spirit of God, best yeah. believe you will reap what you sow. Yeah. Come on, okay. You know, in Genesis 4, chapter, chapter 4, verse 7, it's so interesting. Mm. It's a time before Cain kills his brother Abel. Yeah. And what God says to Cain, I've always found incredibly interesting. Yeah. In Genesis chapter 4, verse 7, mm. this is in the NLT, it says, you'll be accepted if you do what is right. Nice. But if you refuse to do what is right, wow. then watch out. Sin is crouching at the door, wow. eager to control you. <laughs> but you must subdue it and be its master. Wow. Why did he tell him that you need to subdue it? Why did he tell him that you need to be its master just for the sake of saving it? No, because you actually can. Yeah. We're not slated to be slaves to our sin. He told Cain, you must have mastery over the flesh. You yes. must overcome. Yes. You must be the spirit. And as you do, you will rise it up and you will walk in accordance with the spirit. Yes. And it's the same for every single one of us. Yes. No, you got to understand, if you had to like literally physically fight a lion, <laughs> right? you already wouldn't feel super confident unless you're incredibly arrogant. Oh. You would not feel confident if you had any sense. But imagine <laughs> trying to fight a lion, having not eaten for three days. No. Oh, no. Okay. Now imagine oh, no. trying to fight a lion, not eaten for two weeks. Oh, no. Struggle. No. The struggle lion. You're already like a double bar yeah. just trying to fight a lion. If, if you're trying to fight a lion on an empty stomach, I, I just pray that you have a quick death. Oh, <laughs> Hopefully your arm doesn't get involved or your leg doesn't get involved. Just, just uh, go for the jump there. Yeah. Oh, let's, no. Let's, just, let's, let's, let's get it over with. Come on, Come on that. Just you got to understand how is Satan described in the Bible? Wow. A lion. Yeah. yeah. So imagine trying to fight off the lion uh -oh. when you haven't fed the spirit. Woo! Whoa. 
Imagine trying to fight off the lion when you actually haven't fed yourself the oh, word of God. No. It's absolutely impossible. Wow. This is my challenge. Because none of us are slated to lose against our sinful nature. This is what you got to do. Dive deeper in your Bible than you ever have before. Take your prayer life to the next level. Spend more time in the word of God than you do in the world. Every single one of us is ultimately going to be influenced by something. You're either going to be influenced by Facebook or you're going to be influenced by Facebook. Oftentimes we conceal our sin because we think we will prosper. Wow. Because that's how it works in the world. Wow. If you're actually open, if you're actually vulnerable, if you actually tell people what's going on, yeah. oh, no. what do you typically find? People want nothing to do with you. Yeah. People ostracize you. Yeah. People ignore you. But it's very different in the kingdom of God. And you gotta understand, if there's a lion mauling your arm. What is one of the craziest things that you can do? <laughs> Say nothing about it. <laughs> Not ask for help. Wow. Uh -oh. Suffer in silence. It's one of the smartest tactics of Satan. Yeah. Is to trick people to think that if you're open about your sin, you won't find mercy. Yeah. Wow. But the Bible says the one who confesses and renounces them. What is that? That's repentance. Yeah. The one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. Wow. So what do you got to do if you're struggling? You got to be open. Yeah. What do you got to do if you're fighting the lion and you're losing? You got to be vulnerable. Yes, come on, bro. What I find is oftentimes, come on, bro. people only get open after they've sinned. Oh. Yeah. And what does that do? It leads you to living in perpetual sin. Wow. Man, I, I, I sinned. Man, now I'm going to get open. Then I sin again. Then I get open. Here's what you got to do. This is, this is. When somebody taught me, and it changes everything. Help us out right here. Is don't just get open about your sin. Get open about your temptation. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Get open on a thought level. That part, bro. Like, hey, bro, I had this temptation. Pray for me. Wow. Hey, sis, I had this temptation. Please fast with me. Wow. Hey, bro, I had this temptation. Can you please get some time together? I just need help. Wow. And best believe, when you're open about your temptation, yeah. The family of God will wrap their arms around you. Yeah. And the family, we will overcome our sinful nature. Come on. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Let's go, bro. Come on, bro. Thank you, bro. This is awesome. Help us out. Preaching, dog. My brother, man. Let's go, bro. I agree, bro. This is great. Chapter 12 and verse 2, 2 Corinthians. Mm. Come on, bro. Fire, bro. With you, bro. Let's go. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Uh -oh. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know. But God knows, was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things. Things that no one is permitted to tell. I'll boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself, except about my weaknesses. Amen. Wow. Even if I should choose to boast, I will not be a fool, because I will be speaking the truth. But I refrain, yep. so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say. Wow. Or because of these surpassing great revelations, therefore in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, uh -oh. a messenger of Satan to torment me. Oh, wow. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. Wow. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. Wow. 
For my power is made perfect in weakness. Wow. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Yeah. You know, it's a statement of scripture. Yeah. We've got to break down what Paul's actually talking about. What's up? So he says, hey, 14 years ago, this man, I don't know, he's caught up to heaven. It says the third heaven, though. So this is actually where Mormons get the idea of there being different tiers of heaven. Now, the problem is, oftentimes, we'll read the Bible with a 21st century perspective. Right. When we have to read it in the perspective of the people who it was written to. Oh. Yeah. Does that make sense? Oh. So, so we have to understand, how did the Jews actually conceptualize heaven? Oh. In a sense, they actually did believe that there was three heavens. Let me explain. Uh -oh. They thought of the first heaven as what we would regard as the atmosphere. Nice. They thought of the second heaven as the cosmos or the expanse of the sky. Right. And they thought of the third heaven as the place where God domains what we think of heaven. Oh my God. So he said there was a guy who was caught up to the third heaven, Whoa. to the place where God resides. Whoa. And he saw inexpressible things. Wow. He, things that are not even permitted to talk about. Oh, snap. And here's the crazy thing. He says, so that I do not get conceited. So we know Paul's actually talking about himself. Oh, wow. It's about himself. This kind of sucks. He's like, man, I saw all this incredible stuff. And I heard all these incredible things. I can't even talk about it. And God gave me a thorn in my flesh so that I wouldn't get conceited. Oh, snap. Can you understand? Knowing things that no one else knows. Wow. Seeing things that no one else has seen. What would be the temptation? Arrogance. Yeah. Pride. Mm. Yeah. He says, God gave me this thorn. Wow. Why? So that I would rely on him. Wow. When I'm weak, then I'm strong. You know, it's incredible because he begs God yeah. to take away the thorn. Now, many actually debate on what the thorn is. Uh -huh. And there are some crazy theories regarding what the thorn is. Uh -oh. I'll tell you guys some of the most popular ones. Nice. The most popular one is that Paul actually suffered from physical ailments, right. most likely arthritis. Or a lot of people think that Paul actually walked with a limp because he was beaten so much. So he was towed up from the floor. If you know what I'm he, he, was, he was messed up. Oh man! And he's praying to God. God, you are capable of all things. You can fix the situation. You can heal me. And what does God say? No. Ah. He says, "My grace." is sufficient for you. Wow. My power is made perfect in weakness. Wow. Point number two, grace pushes us to overcome adversity. Wow. You know, the incredible thing is when you're in tune with God's grace, there's nothing you can't overcome. Yeah. There's no situation that's insurmountable. Right. There's no thing that can keep you down. Right, bro. And Paul he said, whoa, as a result, I rejoice in my weaknesses. I rejoice in my hardships. I rejoice in my persecutions. Why? Because it gives me the opportunity to rely on God and not myself. Wow. Yeah. Come on, bro. But oftentimes, what we actually do is we pray for God to take away the very thing that he's given us to ensure that we rely on him. Wow. Say, God, please change the situation. God, please switch this around. God, please give me this healing. And ultimately, what we're actually saying is, God, change my circumstance so I don't need to rely on you anymore. Wow. That's Insane. the real heart of it. Insane. And God, in his love, he says, absolutely not. <laughs> absolutely not. I don't know about you guys, I was incredibly inspired by the GNN. Yeah. And the sister in Miami, yes. Melina, yeah. who's suffering from cancer. Yeah. And you see things like that, and this is somebody who you never know, she could pass tomorrow. Yeah. Or a year from now, she has a husband and a kid. Wow. And you see somebody like that, it's so obvious yeah. that she's in tune with the grace of God. Yeah. It's so obvious that she's not relying on her strength, yes. but on God's strength. Come on, man. Yeah. You know, it's incredible because uh, my father, um, in 2016, he was diagnosed with stage four brain cancer. Oh, and it was through this series of events 
that he saw his need for God. And before he passed, I was able to baptize my father. But you know, the thing is, he told me if I never got cancer, I would have never saw my need for God. If I never got cancer, I would have never become a disciple. Do you understand that the thorn that you may have in your life mm -hmm. is not a curse, but a blessing? Wow. Wow. It's not a curse. It's a blessing. Wow. Come on, bro. God has given every single one of us things in life that are not possible to go through wow. without him. Yeah. He's given every single one of us opposition. Why? Because he wants to harm you? No. Because he wants to see you suffer? No. Because he wants to ensure that you make it to heaven. Right. And he knows that the only way is if you rely on his strength and not on our own. Right. Wow. But that is the temptation of mankind. Yeah. It's to rely on our strength. It's to rely on our intellect. It's to rely on our knowledge. It's to rely on our sin. Wow. And he says, absolutely not. Wow. You know the crazy thing is, oftentimes, we have this misconception in the religious world that if you walk with God, your life will be like walking through a, a patch of lilies. Oh, no. That God, he, he's going to part the Red Sea for you. No. Like, you ever seen Bruce Almighty? Yeah. yeah. He just, he, he makes the traffic split in two. Yeah. He just drives. We think that that's going to be walk with God. <laughs> but you read the Bible, you see people like David, who was anointed by God yeah. as the king. And then spent the next 15 years on the run for his life. Wow. 15 years. You know what he writes during that time period? Psalm 23. Yeah. In verse 4. Where he says, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil for you wow. are with me. Wow. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Yes, you know what's incredible? Because the fact that he walked through the valley, most of us would be like, hey, this is kind of crazy. How are you with me? Yeah. David said, no, 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 even though I walk through the darkest valley, mm. God is with me. Yeah. Even though I have this very, very difficult situation, the Lord is my rock. Wow. Even though this is difficult and maybe other people may not understand it, right. I will lean on God's grace yeah. and not my own understanding. Yeah. You know, there's a sister in, um, in Ventura, California, mm who uh, was in Gigi's and I's ministry when we were there, yeah. and her name is Dylan Page. Come on, Dylan. And this sister is, is when you see her life, it's one of the most convicting things. Yeah. Because she has a, a disease known as EDS, and essentially what it is, is, is your tendons, your ligaments, and your joints are incredibly weak. Oh, wow. This girl is 19 years old, yeah. and she has like the joints of a seven-year-old woman. So she has to have wrist brace on everywhere she goes, ankle braces on everywhere that she goes. And you know the crazy thing is, she does not feel bad for herself. No, not at all. <laughs> at all. Wow. She has another disease, I forget what it's called, but essentially she could die at any moment. Wow. And it, I remember having a conversation with her, I was absolutely shocked. She was like, yeah, I'll be lucky if I reach 40, but amen, praise God. <laughs> 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 I was like, oh, no. <laughs> Please convict me more. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. You know what's incredible is everywhere she goes, she has her walker. Yeah. Or she has her wheelchair. And everywhere she goes, she's joyful. Yeah. Everywhere she goes, she's fired up. Yes. Everywhere she goes, she lights up the room. Yeah. Why? Because she understands God's grace. Wow. You know the incredible thing is when you see that girl. You say, wow. Yeah. God is with her. Come on, bro. When you see that despite her situation, despite her circumstances, it leaves you without any excuse yeah. to make any excuses, to quarrel about anything like God, why me? No, you say, man, God, I need to be in touch with your grace like that. Yeah. I need to be so much more appreciative of what you've done, what you're doing, and what you're going to do in my life. Yeah. And we got to understand that the things that God puts us through is not for our harm. Right. No, it's no. for our good. Oh. Here's my challenge. You can clap for that, amen? Hey. Hey. Embrace and be grateful for the challenges in your life. Yeah. Stop praying 
for things to get easier. Yeah, remember. Pray to be closer to God. Amen. Every day, every day, bro. Pray to rely more on His grace. Yep. Come on. You know, there's things in my life that in the past I prayed for God to take away. Right. And I came to the realization through this passage here in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. No, God has given me this, so I stay wow. faithful to him. Come on, Austin. Wow. And so the things that I used to pray for God to eliminate from my life, now I pray with gratitude, God, thank you for giving me that hardship. Come on, thank yes. you for giving me that difficulty. Yes. Thank you for giving me that hardship. Yes. Because when I am weak, then I am strong. Amen. Yes. Go to Acts chapter 20. Come on, bro. Go, bro. Come on, bro. It's great. Awesome, bro. I'm with you, Austin. Help us out. Awesome, Acts 20, and verse 22. Mm. Yeah, bro. Bro. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. Wow. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. Wow. My only aim yeah. is to finish the race wow. and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Wow. You know, it's incredible because Paul, towards the end of, the life, of his life, he understood all of the difficulties that faced him as he made his trek to preach in Rome. And he said, you know what? This is not an assumption. The Holy Spirit warns me everywhere that I go wow. that hardships and prison faces me. Wow. And you know the incredible thing he says? But I don't care about none of that. Oh, I don't care. I'm going to go wherever he sends me. He says, my only aim, my only objective, the only thing that I care about in this world is completing the task that the Lord Jesus has given me. Yes. The task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Come on, Come on bro. Come on, bro. You know what's incredible? Because Paul, you read in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, you know what? I worked harder than all the other apostles. Wow. Why? I think because he was more in tune with God's grace. Wow. Point number three. Grace pushes us to testify. Wow. He says, my only aim, the only thing I care about is not getting that Tesla. Uh -oh. <laughs> it's not making six figures. Hey, on, it's not owning my own home. Uh, it's not looking good in front of people. Hey, hey, come on, it's bro. not trying to have achievement in my social circle. Come on, come on. He says, my only aim, the only thing that I care about right. is testifying to the good news of God's grace. Yeah. 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 But the question is, what is your aim? Wow. What is your goal? Wow. Right. Can you confidently say it's the same as Paul's? Wow. Come on, bro. That your only aim is to help more people get to heaven? Wow. Come on, Austin. That your only aim is to help more people find salvation? Wow. That our only aim is to make disciples of all nations? Come on. Come on. Yeah, bro. That's yes. the heart that it takes to make it to heaven. Wow. Is that the only thing I care about? I don't care about this worldly stuff. Come on, man. Come on, bro. I don't care about the things that the commercials are putting in front of my face. Uh -huh. yeah. All of it is a facade. Read the book of Ecclesiastes. Yeah, come on, bro. Yeah. That's true. This is the only thing that I care about. Not even the San Francisco 49ers. Oh. Amen. Not even, not even the Las Vegas Raiders. Oh. Oh. They go 0 and 17. Who cares? Uh. I'm a 49ers fan. They go 0 and 17. Who cares? Uh. It has zero bearing on my salvation. Come on. That's right. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Go to Mark chapter 5. Come on, bro. What's up? Especially the bar. Come on, bro. This is awesome. Bro. Let's go, bro. This is awesome, bro. I agree, bro. With you, Austin. What's up? Bro, this is awesome. This is one of my favorite. Uh, occurrences in the Gospels. Nice. Yeah, I think it really illustrates mm. the heart of somebody who is truly in tune with God's grace. Come on, bro. Mark 5, verse 1. <laughs> they went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore. 
not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? In the name of God, don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you impure spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission, and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside. And the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man, and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you wow. and how he has had mercy on you. Wow. So the man went away and began to tell the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him and all the people were amazed. Wow. Wow. You know, it's incredible because here you find a man, but I would say in a very similar way, is every single one of us before we knew Christ. Yeah. Yeah. It says that this man was oppressed. He was ostracized. People gave up on him. He's not worth the trouble. He's not worth the, the emotional baggage. He's not worth the time. He's not worth the energy. I'd rather just go in my comfort. Wow. And it says in the man, he was cutting himself. Yeah. He's crying out day and night. People were binding him with iron chains. And none of it was able to subdue him. Come on, bro. And then the one person who cares to do anything is Jesus. Wow. He runs to Christ. He gets on his knees. He says, have mercy on me. And what is up happening? The demons inside of them, they just say, don't torture us. And Jesus, what does he do? He casts the demons into the pigs. Yeah. And then the pigs are drowned in the lake. The man is dressed in his right mind. Can you imagine that? Come on. Just seeing somebody who was so yeah. down bad. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody who was possessed by demons. Yeah. A legion. For those who don't know, it, it's argued how many it is, but a legion is most likely thousands of Roman soldiers, 5,000 wow. Roman soldiers. Yeah. This man said, I am a legion. What is he saying? I have a plethora of demons inside of me. Wow. 5,000. He throws them in the pigs, again, they're drowned. And the people see the man dressing in his right mind, and you would think that they would be encouraged. Yeah. You would think that they would be excited. You would think to say, wow, this is incredible. But all they can focus in on is the pigs. <laughs> Why? Because this was their livelihood. Wow. This was how they made money. If you actually can correlate the amount of value of the pigs in our currency today, this is millions of dollars. That Jesus drowned in the lake for one soul. Wow. One. How much is one soul worth to you? Wow. You know, it's incredible, though, because what is up happening? The people, they come to Jesus, and they say, hey, you need to leave. You cost us enough financially. And Jesus, he does leave. But the guy, he comes up to him, he says, please let me go with you. And what does Jesus say? No. Go and tell your hometown about how much the Lord has done for you. Wow. And the crazy thing is, the guy, he doesn't just go to his hometown. It says he goes to the Decapolis. If you look at the footnote in your Bible, the Decapolis means the ten cities. So the guy was told to go preach in his hometown. What did he do? Ten times more than Jesus even expected. He wasn't even told to do it. Jesus said, go 
love your hometown. He said, yeah, that's not even enough. Wow. <laughs> I'm going to go to that city. 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 And they're all going to know how much the Lord wow. has done for me. Wow. That's the one to do with the grace of God. Oh, that is the proper response when you understand how much the Lord has done for us. Is we go above and beyond what is even expected. Not because somebody told us, not because Austin preached it, but because it's within your own heart, because it's your own conviction, because of the grace that God has given us. But you know what's incredible is this same story is actually written in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Now, Luke is very similar to the story we just read in Mark. But let's go over to Matthew chapter 8. Come on, bro. Matthew gives a little insight that Mark does not. Uh oh. Come on, bro. Come on, Matthew. Help us out. Come on, Matthew. Go, bro. Come on. Come on, bro. In Matthew chapter 8, in verse 28. <laughs> When he arrived at the other side in the region of the Gerdes, two demon possessed men uh -oh. wow. coming from the tombs met him. They were so violent that no one could pass that way. Wow. What do you want with us, Son of God? They shouted. Have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? Some distance from him, a large herd of pigs was feeding. The demons begged Jesus, if you drive us out, send us out into the pigs. He said to them, Go. So they came out and went into the pigs, and the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and died in the water. Those tending the pigs ran off, went into the town, and reported all this, including what had happened to the demon-possessed men. Then the whole town went out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they pleaded with him to leave the region. You guys notice any difference in the story? There's two men. So we understand that Mark, there was two men who actually were healed. Wow. So the question then becomes, why does Matthew talk about two people, whereas Mark and Luke talk about one? Uh -oh. Well, if you actually look at the Gospel of Mark, he doesn't just talk about what Jesus did, but he talks about what the guy did in response. Yeah, come on up. But what can we infer? That probably only one of them actually went to preach about it. So Mark, he doesn't even say anything about the guy. The other guy who was healed, but he did not go out and preach, he wasn't even worth being written about. Here's the crazy thing. They were both healed. They were both freed. They were both redeemed. But one of them, we don't even know about it. Whereas the other guy, his actions are recorded for all time. And you know, the reality is, you may be a disciple, saved, healed, redeemed by the blood of Christ. But in the church, every single one of us is actually one of these two men. We're either the person who is not worth writing about, or we're the person who goes to the Decapolis, goes above and beyond what Jesus even said, and we flat tell the world about what Jesus has done for us. The question is, which are you? Wow. Wow. Come on up. Which? You know, it's incredible because, Paul, when you read through the epistles, as time goes on, what you find is this man just became more and more in tune. Yeah. With the grace of God. Yeah. If you look in 1 Corinthians 15, I'm going to rattle these off. You can write them down and study them. No. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 9 and 10. This is 57 AD. Paul says, I am the least of the apostles. But then in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8, this is five years later in 62 AD, he says, No, I'm the least of the Lord's people. Wow. And then in 65 AD, Three years later, he says, no, I'm not the least of the apostles. I'm not the least of the Lord's people. I'm the worst of all sinners. Wow. Yeah. So as he aged, 
he became more and more in tune with God's wow. voice. Wow. But where are you tonight? Come on. Yeah. Are you looking at the warning signs? Mm. Wow. Come on, and are you willing to do something about it? Wow. The incredible thing is, all it takes is putting fuel back in that tank, baby. Yeah, come on. All it takes is applying this back to our life. It. And my challenge for every single one of us is share your faith. Talk about what God has done for you uh, more than you ever have in your life. Yeah, more than you ever have. Go out with intention every single day. I'm going to be like the man who went to the capitalist. I'm going to tell this person and this person. No. I'm going to tell my coworker. No. I'm going to tell my mom. Yeah. I'm going to tell my brother. Yeah. I'm going to tell my professor. Right. I'm going to tell my employer yeah. about yeah. what the Lord has done for me because I'm fueled by the grace of God. Woo. Can you imagine if every single person on. in these seats fueled by the grace of God goes out with the same objective as Paul on our hearts. Mm. Wow. Whereas Jeremiah says in Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 9, there is a fire within my bones. I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. That's what Jeremiah said about when he went to go preach to Israel. He says, you know what? Even if I wanted to hold it in, I couldn't. Even if I wanted to take my mouth shut, I will just rip it off. Even if somebody tried to stop me from proclaiming the word of God, all I can do is let it out. Wow. Come on, come on, come on. And let me tell you, if you don't know, that is you. Wow. Wow. All it takes is just being in tune wow. with how much God yeah, come on, bro. has done for you. Lock in, come on, bro. This is my challenge. Yeah. Write a gratitude list. Mm. Write all that you're grateful for. Yes. Write everything that God has done for you. Write everything that you're grateful that God did not do. Oh. All the stuff that we may have really, really wanted, yeah, but, but that was problematic for a life that would have destroyed us. Right. And God was like, nope, I'm not going to answer that. Oh. Nope, I'm not going to do that. Yeah. Write a gratitude list of all that he's done for you. And then look at it and say, God, you know what? I am so fueled yeah. by your grace. I'm going to do more. I'm going to go further. I'm going to achieve more than I've ever done before. Because of your grace. Because of what you've done. Come on, bro. You know, it's incredible because, again, grace is one of the most misunderstood wow. topics in the Bible. Mm -hmm. I think now we've come to realize that grace yeah. is probably one of the most intense passages. Yeah, that's so true. It's one of the most intense uh, ideas in the Bible. Wow. And it becomes very, very clear when we're fueled mm -hmm. by the grace of God. Come on. No one teaches us to say no to God with us. Yeah. Now we're in that situation and we have the chance to feed the flesh. We say, absolutely not. Yeah, bro. I can never do that to my Lord who died in my place. Yeah. Yeah. That when we have adversity, that we have hardship, and we're tempted to say, God, why? Instead, we say, God, thank you. Wow. Because I'm no longer relying on my own strength. But it's when I'm weak that you are strong. Yeah. It's when I am weak that it is obvious that you are working in my life. And that very thorn that you may have been praying for God to eliminate from your life may be the very thing that he's giving you to ensure that you make it to heaven. Wow. And also that grace pushes us to testify. You know, it's incredible because when I look at the GNN and I see all the, the incredible people who are baptized, I think a lot of people are like, well, why does the number matter? Why does the number matter? Do you understand that, that numbers show the magnitude of the miracle? Yeah. Can you imagine when Jesus fed the 5,000 and then the 4,000 and just said, you know what? He fed a lot of people. Yeah, it, it would not really hit you in the same way. The fact that it was 5,000 people, the fact that it was 4,000 people shows the magnitude of the miracle. And it's in the same way when we say, whoa. 30 disciples had 300 people at a women's day, it shows the magnitude of the miracle. When we say, whoa, that 80 disciples, 100 disciples, they helped baptize 100 people into Christ, it shows the magnitude of the miracle. Yeah. And we have to understand that God wants to use our life yeah. for what? To testify yeah. about his grace. Yeah. You know, in every single thing that you do, if anybody ever asks you, why do you do that? Oh. Why do you go there? 
Why are you showing your face so much? How can you overcome that adversity? Then we all say one simple thing. It's by the grace of God. Amen.